Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Kaba Santa Yanda Rabahand Shindere de Bicata, Yanda Rabahand Shindere de Bicata, Rabahand Shindere de Bicata, La Caraba Coriander Rabahand Shindere de Bicata Rabada, Yander Coriander Rabahand Shindere de Bicata Rabah. Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Father, we honor you. Kaba Sandi in the Rabba Coriander. Carabasa Cataraba Carabaso Coriander Rabahand Shindere de Cata. Yando Coriander Rabahand Shindere de Cabaso Coriander Rada. Sisters, bear with me one second. Cabason to Yander Rabahand Shindere de Cata. Yander Rabacaramaso Cotu. Bear with me, bear with me, sisters. Hallelujah, Father, we give you praise. We honor your name. Rabba Koriander, Rabba Handa, Sander, and the Rabba Ba. Kaba Suntishander, Rabba Karaba, so Koriander, Rabba Ha. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Sorry, sisters, I was just having a few technical problems there. Father, we give you praise, we honor your name. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So, um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us as tonight's Keepers at Home session. Let's just start by um, an opening prayer. We give you all the praise. Hallelujah. Precious, loving, God, we are so grateful to you. Loving Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence once again, to learn what you will teach us through this session. We are thankful for all our speakers tonight. We ask that their sharing, Father, be as planned and that your spirit, O oh Lord, and your presence will be with us through this session. Father, we ask for hearing ears, receptive hearts. We focus tonight, O oh Lord. We focus tonight on what you will do. We give you all the praise. We pray that you will move anything that will distract us. We thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen, amen. and amen. Amen and amen. So, um, Sister Jacqueline, can you um, make me co-host, please? Yes, just bear with me. Just bear with me one second. Oh. Bear with me, please. Okay. Kaba Santi and Rabba Baka and the Father, we give you praise. We give you praise. All right. So good, good evening, sisters, and um, welcome to this evening's Keep Us At Home session. I hope that you're all doing very well by the mercies of God. So tonight um, we'll be discussing the topic, Living With Health Challenges. We'll hear from um, resource persons that have walked the walk in living with health challenges and also those that are supporting individuals in their journey of walking the walk. Every journey we, we note is different and personalized. So this evening, we'll look at discussing and understanding with the help of the Holy Spirit. We'll plan to also hear from a professional's perspective who works in a care setting, supporting those living with health challenges. And at the end of this, you know, with the sharing as usual, we'll have the opportunity to, to ask um, our speakers any questions that we need to ask. Okay. So sisters, if you have any questions during any part of this evening, please send them directly this is the Adjoa into the chat box. 
Oh my goodness, sorry, we're just having some technical problems here. But bear with me, please, sisters. What is happening? Okay. All right. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yes, I am. Um, I'm having a lot of sort of texts coming through from other people at the moment. So, um. Sister Jacqueline, Sister, are you are you on? Sister Jacqueline, I I'm back now. Can you please make me co-host? Thank you. That's me. All right, one second, please. Thanks, Sister Adriel, can I ask you to chase up our first speaker for me? All right. Apologies for that, um, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know how many of you got to hear um the the introduction. Um, so this evening, as I said, we are gonna be um discussing um living with um health challenges okay and as I mentioned before we're going to hear from resource persons that have walked the walk in living with health challenges and also those um, that are supporting individuals in their journey of walking the walk as I explained before every journey we know is different and personalized so this evening we will be discussing and understanding a bit more with the help of the Holy Spirit um this particular topic okay may i know if sister shadeen is on the line at all is sister shadeen on the line i'm trying to get in touch with her um as we speak sister is sister Philomena on the line is it possible for her to go first Okay, so I'm here. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Philomena. And um, just a quick introduction for um, Dr. Philomena then. Um, Dr. Philomena Darzi is a lecturer at um, UPSA with the Banking and Finance Department and the Dean of Students. Philomena is married and has three adult daughters. She also... Um, is a member of the Closer Walk Wives um, platform. And sisters, let's welcome Sister Dr. Philomena, please, as she takes us through her journey. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my experience with you. And my prayer is that my story will minister life and hope to anyone who would, you know, get hold of this recording. Okay, so the topic is living 
with health challenges, how I walked the journey and how God played a key role in coping time, coping in times of discouragement. Um, it also says that living with a health challenge can be challenging, but it's possible to maintain a fulfilling and meaningful life with proper strategies and support. Okay, so um, I think I'll start from, it's been a journey. And so I'll say it started from 2012, 2012, just when I had started my PhD. And I started my PhD in 2011. And then in 2011, November, and then by June 2012, I started having symptoms. And the symptoms was that I felt a bit uh, numb in my legs and I couldn't walk fast. I was walking very slowly and I was just wondering what it was, but I had to travel in between. So when I came back, I had to go through a series of tests. Now the diagnosis came out as um, bilateral foot drop. That is the name of the sickness they said, bilateral foot drop. It could also be some people to say bilateral drop foot. And um, this condition is actually characterized by an inability to actually lift the front of both feet properly. So, the normal person would walk lifting the feet, but in my situation, I can't lift my feet up. So um, it's a condition which results from weaknesses in the nerve damaged in both legs. So these diagnoses led to the, 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 the situation which I found myself. Difficulty lifting the front part, which causes the toes to drag. So instead of just lifting it up to even wear slippers, you can't do that. To wear your shoe, you can't do that. So you have to actually drag your feet or lift it up higher than usual to be able to walk. Then there's an abnormal gait, you know, with the, so the tendency is that the normal walking, which you would, you know, go the normal way, you would have to lift your foot slightly higher. Otherwise, it will hit back on the floor. You would trip and fall. And then there's also the problem of difficulty with balance, you know, and there's increased risk of falling. So if you stand for a longer period, you you and you don't hold on to something there's a tendency that you are going to trip or you are going to fall because you don't have that balance. And then you can find numbness in your foot, in your, in your legs and your feet. So when this happened that, I mean, it took a time. Uh, within six months, I was totally down because um, it was a diagnosis period. Uh, we were not sure what it was. Um, hospital after hospital treatment, different treatment. I ended up traveling to Germany, going to US, different places just to find out exactly what was wrong with me. So by December, I'd, I'd gone to Germany and uh, I had to stay there for six weeks in the hospital. Still, there was no proper diagnosis. But anyway, I came back. And I found myself being deteriorating by the day. So by December, I was totally in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk. And because I was lying there for a long time, my um, limbs were all weak. My nerves were all, you know, just down. So initially, I was living in a denial stage. I didn't want to accept the fact that this is what was happening to me. So I always had the hope that I'm going to go back to my original state. 
has going to go back to my original state, you know. So I just said that oh, this is something temporary, and which I still had that at the back of my mind that I can do. Uh, uh, um, you know, I had that confidence that um, it's just it's just for a period, it's just for a season, you know, and that I'll come back to my original state. But I realized that God treats people not the way you think, but he has a way of doing his own or planning the way you should go. So now people see me and think that nothing has happened to me. Unless I get up and I walk, they wouldn't know that ah, you said something happened to you. And those who also saw me in my state um, see me as a miracle child because they think that with what I went through, can she, you know, how was she able to recover? This, but you see, it was a good, this is my 11th year. And I really don't like to talk about it because it looks like when I talk about it, I'm just reliving the whole time period. But I, I stand here to talk about it because God has taken me out of it. And I know it will encourage somebody else who is also going through this same phase. So I was living in a denial stage. I didn't want to accept it. I, I know I'll come back and all that. And so I used to encourage myself. So at a point when um, I was sitting in a wheelchair, I couldn't actually do anything by myself. I had to be carried to bath, to the bathroom. My husband had to, you know, wash my clothes, my panties and things like that. I couldn't bath for my, because I didn't have the strength, the energy to do all that. So my children too, I had, at that time, I, I think my last girl was like uh, eight years or so. She's 18 now. So that, that's, that means she was like six because it's been 11 years or like five. So I remember one day she came, she started praying. She said, mommy, you would walk again. You are going to be well again. Yeah. She used to speak like somebody is just speaking through, uh, uh, through her. And we, we'll try and record it. And then by the time we realized to put all these things together, the 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 laptop, the iPad crashed. Every information that we had to put it together crashed. But nevertheless, we still put I still put together the book, but with no pictures. Okay, so like I said, I was living the denial stage. Then I decided that. I'm going to accept the situation because it was taking longer than I expected to come back. But like I said, those who know me think that I've recovered in a way that they, they don't know that I feel sick. But it was a gradual process. So like I was living, sitting in a wheelchair, then gradually I came, I started using the Zima frame, you know, I used to hold it up and then I'll try and walk, you know, a little. And then by another period, now I was using a ruler, you know, and that was that I had spent about a one and a half or, you know, almost, yeah, close to one and a half years at home, you know. I was a lecturer, but, um, I was just at home, I, did, I couldn't teach, I couldn't just do anything. I just started the PhD too. I had to put it on hold. And so I just, as I was going through the hospital medications and going to the hospital once in a while, you will give me some drugs and then I'll go, and then I come back, nothing happens, you know, no change. So it was like I was living, waiting to die just in that state. And then if I if I go out and come back, go to the hospital and come back, 
I see that no change. It's even getting worse, you know. So one day, I think something very spectacular happened in my house. We went to the hospital, we came back, and we were just praying with um, some friends. And then the pastor said, oh, she's got the leading that we should throw uh, water at the doors, at the entrance of every door. So he started with my bathroom, bedroom. The, we started, she started pouring the water. When we got to the main, I was in the hall. When we, uh, I was in the bedroom. When uh, the, the pastor got to the entrance, the main entrance of my house, and you pour the water. Then the curtains in the hall lit fire, like, you know, literally fire with the curtains all burning. Ah, so my, my friend had come to visit me from the US. She said, ah, are you sure there was no electrical? I said, no electrical. They went to look everywhere. The fire had just, you know, burnt the curtains and everything there. So they put out the fire, they prayed, and then they said, um, whatever it is has been planted in my, in the, I mean, all sorts of things. And so the moment I entered the, the house, all the sickness reignite again, whatever it is. What we're doing was just still praying. So at a point in time, I now started using the same frame, like I said, and then I went gradually i said this time i was going to go to back to work even though i wasn't fully recovered but i could see improvement and i thought i stayed at home for far too long and so i just wanted to interact go back to work so they had to write um, the doctor had to write a letter to my school asking them to change the position of my office to the ground floor the washrooms close to me and then um, my furniture and any other thing that will make my life comfortable. So that was, uh, I think, a period I stayed home for about almost a year and a half, or almost two years. When I went back, before I went back, I told God that, Lord, I don't want to go back with uh, sitting in a wheelchair. Neither do I want to use a Zima frame. I want to go back, at least even if I could take some steps. So God answered my prayer. I wasn't still able to walk freely, but at least I could take steps. And then I used to hold the, like on my way to my office, because I was on the ground floor, I used to hold the walls sometimes because I didn't want to use the Zimmer frame. Neither did I, 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 I wanted to, neither did I want to use the walker. So I just thought that, oh, I think God has answered my prayer. But the quest to, you know, continue to pray and see another change kept coming. So the next thing I said, God, I want to get my balance when at least I am walking. So you could see that I don't have my back. And I couldn't stand. I couldn't stand for about five, two minutes. I can't stand. I need to hold on to something. You know, I need to hold on to something. So if it is not a human being I'm, I'm holding on to, I need to hold on to maybe the rails or something just for support and for balance. And so later on, with a, within a space of time, I mean, this is about uh, after all, after when I started working about uh, 2014, there about. So this went on gradually. And I noticed that I, I was now getting stronger in the limbs. You know, that is because maybe I was using mine. I was doing a lot of physical um, therapy, uh, physio, and <laughs> My one of my uh, personal trainer, I mean, physiotherapist, would say that look, no pain, no gain. So uh, he would come and would do very strong exercises just to, you know, give me some strength in my limbs. 
So I did this continuous and I could see improvements. So then I said, okay, let me go back to the things um, I used to do. So I'll set myself um, some, um, you know, objectives and goals, you know. And uh, one thing I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I had that at the back of my mind. Once I accepted my class, I said, oh, but um, if anybody sees me, everybody will know that um, this, there's something wrong with this. And then, you know, God just told me that, look, I want everybody to know these are your scars. I want, it, it doesn't matter. You can now tell them that this is what happened to you and you can see the way I walk. There's nothing to, to, to be ashamed of. There's nothing to be shy of. And so I accepted that and I had to live and live according to the fact that this is the way I walk. So I asked my doctor one of them, I said, one day I said, doctor, am I going to um, work like this for the rest of my life? So she said, um, uh, when whatever was happening with you, um, if it had been detected earlier, then it could have been stopped, you know, but because it wasn't detected early, so some of the nerves have been damaged, you know. I said, oh, so, I'm, so immediately he, 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 she told me that the doctor who took care of me the first time when we were, you know, trying to see what was wrong with me, I said, having some hatred. I said, ah, when I was going up and down, you, he, he, you couldn't detect that this was the problem with me. And look at how far, so I always had that at the back of my mind. But anyway, God just took it out, the pain and everything. And I accepted the fact that, okay, it's okay. If anybody, if anybody sees me and asks me, I'll let them know. So I ended up trying to defend myself or, you know, people who know you, they will ask you, what happened to you? And people who uh, even don't know you, when they see you, they will stare at you to make sure that they, 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 they are saying, to make sure you know they are saying at you, you know. So it was a bit of a, a, a you know, you feel a, down sometimes, you feel, you know, all that. But, well, I have lived beyond that. And I think that I've accepted the condition that this is what the way I'm, I'm working, but it doesn't change my mindset, my mentality. I live a full life, you know? And so I had to adopt strategies. So for instance, my husband bought me a, a very long chair that when I, I can sit on it in the classroom and then I can see everybody in the class. So, I adopted that in, 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 in my class. Then when it comes to when, like when we have to go to church, I have to, uh, my husband has to park the car close to the door or to the gate or wherever so that the entrance, I don't have to walk that far. And then my children all know that we have to help mommy. Sometimes if she wears shoes, it will be too tight because as when you, I sit for long, my my uh, feet get swollen. So mommy would remove her shoes. So when I get up or when I go to wherever I'm going and I and I get down, they will help me wear my shoes. And then they will also help me, they will hook me to work because maybe I, I might need help. Where I wouldn't need help, I'll let them know that I'm okay, I can I'm, I can come. But when there's a steps and there are no rails, then I will need help. So when I'm going to church, so there are some, uh, uh, there's about one or a step or two step to where I have to sit. So uh, my girls will take me all the way to the step and I'll go to sit and uh, go and sit at where I usually would want to sit because there's also a side rail. And so when the, there's, there's time to um, get up, I can easily hold on to the rail and get up. 
So I have adapted my own way of going around issues. So I've also, the fact that I, I can't do very strenuous, so it doesn't prevent me from doing any activity. I joined a department, the, the political department, and at the desk, I sit there, as when I'm scheduled, I sit at the desk. That one doesn't need a lot of movement. I sit at the desk and then I attend to my um, church members as well. Then I has completely stopped wearing heels. I can't walk in them anymore. Accepted. I don't wear heels. I wear only flat uh, 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 sand uh, shoes or anything flat. I don't do open toe and things like that because um, I can't even lift my, my phone. So I have to cover my whole um, legs with my shoe. I mean, like flat shoes. And then, like I said, if I have to go somewhere, I would like to go early. I don't want to to for people to stare at me and 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 you know. So I just go early, just go and sit down. That's it. And then once I sit down, for instance, if I I have to do payments, most of the time I use my bank application. I don't have to be sending people to go to the ATM and things like that. Or if I have to write a check, that's fine. But I always have to do something that would make me quite independent and not rely too much on people. Because I've realized that when you rely too much on people, they take advantage of you and they bluff. And so I said, no, God, give me the enablement to do the things I can do. And then I have to find ways of living a very independent life. So one thing that I have not been able to do is to get back to driving. And um, I started, actually, I started. But when I started, I realized that my school is very close to my office and my husband passes over through my office every day. Why do I need to stretch? Uh, 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 why do I need to stress to you know, continue to uh, think that I want to drive and all that. What is my motive? So, well, that is my long-term goal, but to get back into driving. But if not, my girls are always available. My husband is always available to help out. Then I always also try to live a very, um, you know, interesting um, life. I use my spare time. I have I joined a lot of uh, my old girls association, and then I join also my group in church, and all. all um, if there's a, any program, they can they would invite me. I tell them, look, it, maybe I cannot work that long, maybe I cannot, but at least my brain is still working. So if there's something you want me to, just give me the topic, and I'll deliver. So I do a lot of um, consultancy work as well. And then um, I also join support groups. You know, I have a, a support group and uh, we meet once in a month. We do this um, um, program every once in a month. Sometimes we do face to face, but most of the time it's on Zoom. And so I join that one as well. And then in the situation where I cannot, um, my husband is not available to take me. My girls, at first I used to do a lot. Of, I would take Uber and go by myself, you know. And when I do something that I can do, uh, or something that I used to do previously, I get so excited. You know, I realize that I'm gradually getting to where I, so one of the days um, I was invited to uh, my office ceremony is like they invited all the deans to a, a sort cutting ceremony. And I thought there were going to be chairs for us to sit on. When I got there, there were no chairs. We were supposed to be standing. And we stood for one whole hour. I couldn't believe I was standing for one whole hour. Hey, I came back. When I closed, I was working alone. I came back. 
came to sit in my office and I just slammed into my chair. And I got so excited. I was very tired because it put strain on my legs, you know. And like I said, nobody knows the trouble I see. But, well, I came back. I was excited. I said, God, I stood for one hour. And I started, I said, though I was tired, but I was excited. And then when they told us that we had a, a, a meeting on the sixth floor, there was no lifts in my building. Hmm. And so when sometimes they would, they would say that um, uh, because I, I didn't want to be, sometimes I don't want to be too much of the center of attraction. So you say, oh, because of Tadazi, oh, let's do it downstairs. Yeah. So I said, oh, don't worry, don't worry, I'll still come. And so I think so, three continuously, there was a meeting on the sixth floor. That's where my department is on the sixth floor. But you believe you me, God gives me the strength. Sometimes I just wonder how God does it. But you just have to take the step. And then, so, you know, it, even though it's on the sixth floor, I gradually I go to the floors, then I rest. The next two, and I rest. And it was a form of exercise, you know. And then when you are climbing, it's difficult. But when you are getting down, it's not that difficult. So when I go and come back, oh, I've done something, it just gives me the encouragement. I just tap myself and say, look, I did it, you know. So now it doesn't matter where they hold the meetings. Sometimes if I'm the chair of the meeting, I bring it downstairs in my office. If it is not somebody else is chairing the meeting and they send it to wherever, I will go. I don't want it to be an excuse that, oh, the Zadaze can't come because it's here. No, I don't want you to use the fact that I cannot walk or I cannot. No, I won't do that. So I will just, I know I can do it. It's just a matter of making the effort. So I just have to set off early. If it's on the same compound, I just set off, set off early, maybe 10, 15 minutes before the time. Walk slowly, get to the place take it easy, and then the meeting starts. So that is how I've, I've, I've uh, you know, gone through this um, situation. Now, um, I wanted to um, set some targets. Now, even though there are certain things that you, I cannot do, during the uh, period, I set myself targets. You can set short-term goals. Like I said, I'm able to work from one department to the other, and it's a great achievement. Sometimes you say, well, the meeting is at the administration block. And I, I'm just wondering, why didn't they bring the meeting here? You know, But if uh, my husband is around, I just say, can you come and pick me? To the depart to the the thing to the admin block, and then sometimes you know God just listens to us. Sometimes by the time you are wondering how to get back to work again, this is a you see somebody who just come, oh, that's a, that's a, you are around, then they will just pick you, and you know. Oh, I was going this way. Are you ready to go? They just pick you, you know. So it, it it's been. It's like God appears, or oh, the, the and I remember what Sister Fe said. Then, um, oh, is this Sister Claire? Uh, is this the, uh, yeah, Claire? She said, an ever present help in times of trouble. So, God just appears. God just just makes it possible at the time when you need it most. You know, so sometimes I go to a meeting on the third or the fourth floor. And I said, hey, do I have to climb and come back, walk all the way to my department? Just then I'll see somebody that I know and the person will just pick me, you know, that and just go and drop me. So I've walked through this setting goals. So the, when I, I, I felt, like I said, 2011, I had to put my PhD on hold, but through it all, I graduated in 2018. 
I didn't give up. So even when I sit down, like I said, I get, my feet get so swollen, but I persevered. I said, no, I won't let this be a stumbling block. I persevered. And when I, you should see me when I was going for my uh, graduation. Hey, I had to, uh, you know, join the queue. And because of the way I work, so I worked, I was having a gap between me and the one in front of me. I cared less. Just took my time and I went. When it got to the point where I couldn't, my husband arranged for a wheelchair for me. That was the 2018. To take me back the long journey. But at least I walked into the... Now, even at that time, my headache was... Because when they call you for the graduation, you have to stand for them to mention your topic that you did your PhD in and all that. I said, hey, God, how can I stand all this? Time? But God made a way. He held my feet. They said all that they had to say. And I had to get, get down and then walk down. Yeah, so... Now, um, I think I have gone through all this. Um, yeah. Then now, sometimes when you have, to, I have to go somewhere. If I have to go somewhere that I don't have anyone who would help me, then you have to resort. Like when I go to church, my girls go to first service. I go to second service. At first, I used to go to second service with him, but they said that second service is too, they take too long. So I have to go myself, by myself, second service. And my husband is also part of the team, so he also sits at a different place. So my girls will wait for me at the entrance. When I come for second service, they will take me to my seat. And then when I close, my husband will, uh, come and stand by me, then we would, we, I can time down the steps. If he hasn't come yet, if he hasn't come yet, then I have to look around to see who I know, a familiar face I know. I said, oh, please, can you help me down the steps? Then they will help me down and then I, I continue my journey. But maybe the door, the, the gate or somewhere that I can get um, help. So this is how far God has brought me, you know. I don't know where I've missed it or where else I would want to add some more information, but this is my journey. So now um, it's been 11 years down the line. I can do a lot of things that I, did, I couldn't do before. I am not where... I'd want to be, but at least I'm not where I used to, you know, I'm not where I used to, and I can do now a lot more other things than um, I used to, you know, and it's because maybe um, from uh, constant uh, physiotherapy and all that, I'm not gaining a, a strength in my bone. And I believe that because like uh, people say that, ah, did you say you felt sick and all that? Says that he would, he who has begun this good work will bring it toward a perfect completion. So sometimes people say, oh, you even look uh, nicer than, you know, uh, previously. And it, you could see it, is, it, is, it wasn't a day. It's been a gradual process, but it's getting there. I remember one day I had a, a, a cousin inviting me to Spain. My husband said, hey, you are no good. I said, I will go. Because since I felt sick, I hadn't gone, traveled by myself. Every time I have to go with either my husband or my girls. So this my cousin bought a ticket for me to Spain. And it wasn't a straight flight. And even when we got to Spain, the, 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 the place he was was Zaragoza. I said, I'll go. I just wanted a change. Just, I think I went for three weeks or so. So I went. I said, irrespective of what the situation is, I'll go. So I went. You know, I was alone. And I went. 
but I knew God was with me because every step of the way he was there. So there are certain things that I dared to do, but I knew that I was daring because I knew God was with me, you know. So I just don't have that that uh, notion that I can't do it, I can't do it. I said, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things. So I've been able to go through this and I'm happy. Thank you very much. I think I'll end it here. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Fulamina. Um, the Lord richly bless you. Thank you. We're so grateful for where, you know, the journey that God is taking you through and 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 brought you to a place where um where he's done so so good. We give him all the praise and honor and adoration. Please um stay with us for some questions a little bit later on. All right, um, sisters, we're going to move on to our next um, speaker. Um, our next speaker is Sister Shadeen. Now, um, Sister Shadeen is here with her daughter, Anisha. Shadeen will share and her daughter will join in towards the end for a few minutes to speak from her perspective as well. Sister Shideen's story, sisters, is an extraordinary one in that she lived like most, she lived like you and me, basically, um, with her full eyesight intact. However, at some point in her journey uh, of life, her eyesight became impaired and she was registered partially sighted. This was in 2005. And then subsequently, she was registered as severely sight impaired in 2010. Currently, she is fully blind and she sees things differently. Shadeen fellowships at the King's House and takes her faith as a Christian very seriously. She's always pleasant and full of smiles. Shadeen is currently an employee at the Royal National Institute of the Blind, and she expresses that he's very grateful to be able to encourage, empower, uh, and inspire others who are entering into the new way of living in the dark. Um, it wasn't always easy, but now she can truly say that, you know, God is her eyes. Sisters, please let us welcome Sister Shireen. Sister Shireen, you're welcome. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you so much, Jacqueline, for inviting me along to this um, forum. Um, it is, it's just by God's grace. I'm really, really grateful and thankful. Um, it's, it, you know, how many times I do this, and it's, it's really, really just so touching because... It has been a journey. Um, thank you, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity. I pray, I pray dear Lord, that you'll be glorified in this. Um, before I start, I hope you don't mind, um, ladies, but if I can just say to you, if you can close your eyes now, please don't feel that you need to do this. Please don't feel that you need to do it, but I just want to say, if you can imagine, closing your eyes for 20 seconds, only do it if you're, you're comfortable. So I'm going to count down from 20 to zero. So it's 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Open your eyes, please. Now, th that was dark for a while, and then now you can see everything. Nothing changes for me. And I've gone from a world of being sighted to just to where it is all just black. Um, if I could just share how this happened. I was, I was fully sighted. I was drove for over 20 years, married, had two children. Um, and in 1990, um, I, I'd, I had a son with my husband at the time we got married. 
Um, just around that time, just before that, though, I was as a, as I was working as a senior um, legal secretary at a firm of solicitors, and it was a very very pressurized job. And one day I was sitting there, and I noticed that one of my eyes was very pulling every time I looked at the screen. And it was very very sharp pain at the back of my eyes. Um, and in the end, that that he, I asked my boss if I could leave, and he said, you know, if you don't mind, finish what you're doing because um, your eye does look a bit mucky but you know I had I had um contracts that needed to be exchanged and obviously you know that was important anyway um at, then we went to lots of hospitals now this is 1990 around about that time I was going to hospitals constantly you imagine from 1990 to 2003 they were just putting drops drops steroid drops it was a uh, some sort of inflammation they said at that time it was something called uveitis or iritis, but it was a secondary disease, inflammation. Something else is causing it. Biopsies, blood tests, urine, everything drops, drops, drops constantly. Sometimes every hour. Um, dilation drops, which which expand your pupil because of the inflammation. Anyway, if I did not take these drops, the symptoms would be. Um, eyes getting red, swollen, extremely painful. And if, for example, if you're lying in a room, I couldn't have the curtains open because the daylight, the sunlight would hit the back of the eye. So the curtains would have to be drawn during the day. And even when the curtain isn't drawn totally and there's a little slit, that light would pierce the back of the eye. Um, I carried on working as much as I could but there was a lot of um, hospital appointments and everything. Um, I had to leave that job because I had, a, I had a child, another child, my daughter, but before that I'd had miscarriages. In this time as well, I'm going along, my mother had strokes. So I was looking after my mother with my sister and my father. Mum um, was in hospital for 11 months. She was paralyzed down the left. So the lady speaking before, um, when my mum went in a wheelchair, I could identify. Um, and we were just supporting her as well. Now, imagine you're going along in a daily life, you're still putting your drops in. And um, I left the solicitors and um, I, would, I did some other work in between. But my husband and I broke up. That was a terrible time. Um, it, very, very painful. You're trying to still live, getting on. You've still got this thing going on with your eyes. Um, and in 2001, I had the opportunity to work at a local authority, social services, and I was a trainee paralegal. I was trying to get my life back together. I was doing very well, but these eyes kept hitting me again. And then unfortunately, I started to get some symptoms in my wrists, in my joints, in my knees. I'd be at work, I'd be at work and then I'd go home. And at night, for some reason, it was at night, I'd get inflammation in my joints or, and I couldn't move. Perilous, it was absolute terrible crippling pain. And um, long, long story short, with that, I had to have another test at another hospital. They did a bronchoscopy in my lungs and that came out with what the underlying condition was. And it's something called sarcoidosis. And that's as a result of this sarcoidosis, I, have now, I am now totally blind. As I said, I was at the, I've become a paralegal now, I'm there. And unfortunately, you imagine I'm a paralegal for social services um, for, for, this, for the um, children's department. And on the same floor that I was working was the education team. So I'm working with the solicitors, but I wasn't being supported. I didn't have a very supportive team and I was being treated unfairly. So that was stress on top of everything else. So my marriage just broke up. My mum has passed on now. She died. My sister's been diagnosed with MS and I'm struggling with the um, sarcoidosis and with my two children. Nearly lost my home how many times? They sacked me. They sacked me in the legal team. Um, I was in the state. As I say, the house nearly got taken away from me. Um, I was just going all over the place. I'm not the person that, that you might be able to see me now. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have recognized me. Anyway, I was ringing everywhere, ringing everywhere. After, you, after the kids have gone to school, that is when it all would come out of me. I can say it all now because my daughter's an adult now. But that was when it would the, 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 it would all be released in the daytime. The, the, if the walls could talk, they would tell you. Um, and one day out of the blue, I got a call from the RNIB, the legal team, Royal National Institute of Blind People. The lady said to me, could you just tell, we're ever so sorry, we got a call from you how many months ago, we're sorry, 
and um, we took so long could you tell us what happened and I told them that I've been dismissed from my job what condition I was in I can't pay my bills I'm desperate and they told me that they think they'll be able to help me what they did wrong at this job was they got rid of me but they didn't tell me about something called access to work and access to work is where you have a disability of any type they're supposed to you know apply for you to have unreasonable I'm sorry reasonable adjustments and get you equipment to enable you to carry on with your job so this lady said you know what we're going to have to come and see you at your office I said okay well I'm not there no more but I had to make arrangements to go and um they could view where I used to sit it was an open plan office I, I'm, I'm now registered as partially sighted so I can see but I can't see things like the bus numbers you know things are a little bit more distant but I could still very grateful to still be able to see um but I had no job and I, I, I was waiting outside the building and I saw a black taxi pull up and out of this black taxi came a blind lady, a blind lady with a guide dog and, a, and, and someone else was with her. And in the end, it was my solicitor, a blind lady. And it was solicitors that sacked me. Now how, I'm thinking, God, how is this gonna work? So when they got to my floor, the, the support worker was saying to her, she could have had this, she could have had a larger screen, she could have had a magnifier, reading, and, and, and I don't know what any of these things are. Anyway, as a result of that, they were found that it was negligence and um, I, run, I won the case. I got, I'm happy to say now, I got 20,000 pounds. But at that time, I was in so much debt. That was like a little drop in the ocean. It helped for the principal, for the principal it helped. Um, I won that case, I was, I was grateful, but I needed a job. I started to volunteer. I volunteered at the church. I go to the King's House. I volunteered for the Red Cross. I volunteered at North Middlesex Hospital. But those things, you know, I'm, you know, I'm having difficulty now. The site is deteriorating. As a result of being with the RNIB, I started to attend there. And then I realised that um, they have support for people who are going blind. That You know, they've got classes to use the computer again classes to see if you can get employment again, or living well with sight loss, just to see how you can do things around your home a bit better, because I would hoover and polish. And my daughter would say, oh, mum, I've got to do the polishing and hoovering now, because I thought it was done. It wasn't done properly. And that used to hurt, really used to hurt, because I was quite, you know, I, I like doing what I have to do in my own home. Your independence gets taken away. And then I had the opportunity to go to Loughborough College, Loughborough College in, um, yeah, Loughborough is the RNIB College, to learn how to use the computer again. But by that time, this was in 2014, the 14th of January, 2014, in that period of time, my sister's health has got worse and she had to go into a care home the week before I went to this um, course because I didn't want to go unless my sister was okay. That is a story in itself. So I've gone to this college, I've got no confidence. I'm absolutely just walking with a cane now. I'm severely sight impaired. The man who was teaching me how to use the, in a college setting was blind. He'd gone blind through going through a car window. And I was thinking if he can do it, he can teach me. Now I can't use the comp computer anymore with my eyes. And this was what I was trying to continue to do because I was having to enlarge everything but it was too large for the screens and it was hindering me. And so I used something called, I got learned, I learned how to use something called JAWS, Job Access with Speech. And it's, you wear your headset, I type, because I was always a um, touch typist. So I learned how to type when they covered the keys. I can't see the keys now, so I could still type. But it was, a, it was a, I had to go there for six months. And every weekend I could come home, every other weekend. I would come home one weekend to see my daughter and family here, and then I'd go to Birmingham the other weekend to go and see my dad, um, who, who had moved to Birmingham. Um, if I could just say one thing at this point. In 2002, it was Christmas Day, and it was my first Christmas without having a husband and having that family setting. Um, I was trying to be happy. I was covering all the, the pain. I don't know if all of us know when we mask in that we're doing well, but inside you're breaking. And I had people around coming for dinner. Um, and during the day, I just thought, let me check the turkey. I didn't, I made a big error. I didn't take out, take out the turkey. And before I did, I didn't lift up the foil. So when I lifted up the, the tin to bring it out, 
the oil came over my hand. My daughter, can, can anybody see this? Well, then they have to hold it up. Okay, yeah. can you see? I don't know if you all can see, but I've got a very bad burn there. No, it's not clear. Oh, you can't see? Mm -mm. Okay, sorry. I've got a very bad burn just above my wrist on my left hand. And the oil had flew on there. 